On my return trip to Paris, I saw the first devastating signs of war. A train had been carrying whole school classes of children, old people, women. It had been machine gunned. In May 1940, Gladys Arnold is the only Canadian reporter in France. I walked through the train. Blood was spattered everywhere. Broken glass and tufts of hair were partially embedded in the back of a seat. I rushed to a washroom and wretched. German dictator Adolf Hitler has launched his lightning war. Denmark and Norway are first to fall, then Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium. Now, France crumbles. Gladys Arnold joins the flood of refugees fleeing the advancing German armies. In the midst of horror, they find kindness in a small French village. Long trestle tables had been set up under the trees, and upon them were heaped literally tons of ripe strawberries. As the refugees moved down an avenue of dappled plane trees, women, old men and children urged them to fill anything they had with the luscious, fragrant fruit. Just behind them, German forces enter a shocked and silent Paris. France is lost. Gladys Arnold presses on to the port of Le Verdon and a scene of utter chaos. French officials, British officers and dockhands tried to keep order and told us that we could take on board only what we could carry. People frantically clawed through trunks and boxes, tossing out the contents. Women were throwing away valuable furs, gowns, coats and treasured trinkets. As warplanes battle overhead, Gladys Arnold escapes to an untroubled Canada. There seemed to be little awareness that our whole future was at stake. Should Britain fall, Germany would have a base from which to attack North America. I wanted to shriek, wake up for God's sake, it could happen. The war will transform Canada and its people. It will divide a country and unite a continent. It will spark brutal intolerance. And momentous change. It is a story of triumph over tyranny. Of unimaginable death and dislocation. For those who survive, it will bring unexpected promise and prosperity. A new Canada will be forged out of the fires of war and a proud and confident nation will take its place on the world stage.
June 1940. Nazi Germany has Europe in its grip. Its forces mass at the English Channel, poised to invade England a mere 21 miles away. A defiant British Prime Minister Winston Churchill warns the world it is on the razor's edge. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. An anxious Prime Minister of Canada takes his morning walk among his collection of ruins at his Kingsmere estate. With Mackenzie King is his closest companion, Pat, an aging and arthritic terrier. King fears the worst is at hand. There is a real possibility of invasion of our shores. We have therefore changed now to the stage where defense of this land becomes our most important duty. It will involve far-reaching measures. Once Britain's dependent colony, Canada is now its most important ally. 21-year-old Charlie Martin is of English stock. The farmhand from Long Branch, Ontario enlists in the Queen's own rifles. There was a sense of fear, if not fear, alarm that a foreign power could approach or even invade Canadian soil. England might be next, and after that, what? Nobody expected to be home by Christmas. In the dark summer of 1940, there is no shortage of volunteers. Women mobilized to defend the homeland. Many French Canadians sign up, although most regiments are English institutions in language and tradition. Quebec's famed Royal 22nd Regiment, the Van Dues, is among the first to ship abroad. A young law student named René Levesque wants to get involved, but will only do it by working with the U.S. Office of War Information. The least I can say is the prospect of going to Valcartier to be ordered in English to peel potatoes in the name of His Majesty hardly turned me on. Prime Minister Mackenzie King faces an excruciating dilemma. He has promised French Canada he will never conscript men for overseas service, but he must mobilize for all-out war. And so today, the government of Canada introduced a bill in the House of Commons requiring persons to place themselves, their services, and their property at the disposal of His Majesty and the right of Canada. King crafts the National Resources Mobilization Act. It gives the government sweeping powers, but stops short of conscription for overseas service. Single men are called up to serve for home defense only. But many French Canadians suspect it is the first step towards conscription. Camillien Oud, the beloved and rambunctious mayor of Montreal, tells his fellow French Canadians to defy the law. I do not myself believe that I am held to comply with the said law, and I have no intention of doing so. And I ask the population not to comply with it. Oud is seized and spends four years in an internment camp with enemy aliens, communists, and fascists. Americans, too, are reluctant to become involved in the war. But President Franklin Roosevelt fears a British defeat and moves to secure his northern flank. He invites King to Ogdensburg, New York, for a private meeting. Roosevelt was sitting in a corner in his white suit, enjoying soda lemonade. 
he looked exceedingly well, was in a very happy mood. Roosevelt drafts an agreement. It establishes a permanent board responsible for the joint defense of the two countries. I questioned him as to the significance of the use of the word permanent. He said at once that he attached much importance to it. I said I was not questioning the wisdom of it, but was anxious to get what he had in mind. He said it should not be designed to meet alone this particular situation, but to help secure the continent for the future. For Canada, the world has changed. King tells Parliament Canada's future lies with America. The new arrangement is part of the enduring foundation of a new world order, based on friendship and goodwill. In the furtherance of this new world order, Canada is fulfilling a manifest destiny. In the summer of 1940, the fate of North America and the world hangs in the balance. I have decided to prepare and, if necessary, to carry out a landing operation against England. The aim of this operation is to eliminate the English motherland as a base from which war against Germany can be continued. On August 8, 1940, Hitler unleashes the Luftwaffe to clear the way for his invasion of Britain. The Germans must destroy Allied air forces by the middle of September, or winter weather and tides will delay invasion until spring. Churchill tells his island their survival is now at stake. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. A few hundred Allied fighter pilots stand in Hitler's way. Among them, Montreal's Heartland de Montreville Molson, Ottawa's Jean Paul Deloge, and Ed Reno from Halifax. Saskatchewan's Ernest McNabb leads them in the Royal Canadian Air Force's number one squadron. On the eve of battle, McNabb is worried. This is the lowest point in my life. I didn't think my men were ready for combat. They have spent only 20 hours in their planes. They have fired only once at a moving target. Now they must face the fearsome Luftwaffe. It is certainly an awful sight to behold those ugly black bombers in rank after rank. Your mouth dries up like cotton wool. You lose all sense of space and time. We fought far above the clouds in a world of our own, a world of freezing cold, of limitless space traced with white plume trails of wheeling aircraft as they fought. It was like skywriting gone mad. In their first week of battle, five Canadian planes are shot down. Canadian airmen are outgunned and outnumbered. Hartland Molson is close to exhaustion. 
Since noon yesterday, we have done seven patrols of at least an hour each. Having had two slugs and dinner, it is now time for sleep. Because we go at dawn tomorrow. But on September 15th, the Luftwaffe has run out of time. Allied air forces must be destroyed that day. Air raid sirens wail over London. Underground in the command bunker, Churchill watches as waves of incoming German aircraft are plotted. It is an all-out attack. Every plane the Allies have is in the air. I ask the Air Vice Marshal, what other reserves have we? There are none, he replied. The odds were great. Our margins small. The stakes infinite. Four miles above, Ernest McNabb and his young Canadians are in the middle of the fateful battle. There were more than a thousand aircraft in the sky. There was as much danger of colliding with another fellow as there was of being shot down. I counted nine aircraft falling at one time, and there were parachutes everywhere. It was a terrific spectacle. The world waits. By the end of the day, Germany has lost the Battle of Britain. Although British cities will be bombed nightly for the next six months, the threat of invasion is over, and Canadians have proven themselves in their first battle of the war. dawn, in December 1940, a German submarine torpedoes the British freighter Western Prince. On board is C.D. Howe, Canada's Minister of Munitions and Supply. He is left floating in an open lifeboat in the icy North Atlantic. There's little chance of rescue. In Ottawa, the Prime Minister contemplates losing the man he considers most valuable to the war effort. Throughout the day, I have been turning in my mind possible men to take his place, but I can think of none. King has entrusted Howe with the task of achieving an industrial miracle, transforming a Canadian economy still crippled by the Depression into a mighty war machine. A former engineer who made a fortune building grain elevators, Howe is a man who gets things done. We have no idea of cost, but before the war is over, everything will be needed, so let's go ahead anyway. If we lose the war, nothing will matter. If we win the war, the cost will still have been of no consequence and will have been forgotten. He assumes near dictatorial powers. He tells business what it will produce, how much, how fast, and where. In 1940, the Allies need fighter planes. 
How entrusts this critical job to an unlikely figure? She likes to cook, plays bridge, knits, and likes afternoon teas. James Montagnus, The New York Times. Her name is Elsie McGill. Her grandmother was a suffragist, her mother a judge. McGill has overcome crippling polio to become Canada's top aeronautical engineer. Cancar on Lake Superior had built railway boxcars. Now they have one year to build a plane they have never seen before. McGill must design the machines that will manufacture 60,000 different parts. Each must be perfect. They were designed so the parts would fit together like a child's mechano set. Parts from one airframe are interchangeable with those of another. You can see how useful this would be when they are repairing an airplane damaged in action. One year later, the first hurricane rolls off the line. McGill becomes a war hero, a symbol of the miracle of Canada's wartime transformation. A comic book devoted to her exploits is created by the Americans. McGill is not alone. Almost half of the 7,000 people who work at the aircraft plant are women. For the first time, state-funded daycare centers are set up so mothers can work. The gates to a different life have opened and will never fully close again. In Montreal, 22-year-old Madeleine Perron goes to work in the factories as a union organizer. It's a world away from her middle-class upbringing and convent education. How remarkable it was that when women were given the chance, they were able to do the jobs, which the captains of industry had always said women were incapable of performing. Women leave the countryside for the cities where the giant war plants are located. They can earn as much as $25 a week there, seven times the pay for a live-in domestic. Edna Jakes is almost 50 when the war starts. A single mother and poet, she joins 9,000 others at a munitions factory in Ajax, Ontario. The work is hot dirty and worse. Now we are in the danger zone. No silk or rayon is allowed, no bobby pins, no cigarettes or metal clasps because of danger from sparks. We are given wooden shoes with no nails in them. The air is filled with explosive dust. In Canada, women are helping to transform plowshares into swords on a scale almost unprecedented in history. One dreary night, a young boy began to sing as if to himself, land of hope and glory. In a second, everyone in the shop was singing tunefully as if it had been rehearsed. To the long white ceiling the song floated, and down the glistening hallways, and behind it the click of steel on steel, the whine of the presses, and the sound of the levelers tamping the powder. The of war has changed. The struggle will be won as much in the factory as in the field. 
In December 1940, the man in charge of it all is facing death in the North Atlantic. After a day on the open seas, a small steamer appears. Clarence Decatur Howe survives to build his war machine. But none of it counts unless it gets across the Atlantic. The Canadians know it, the British know it. So do the Germans. The seas are infested with deadly hunters. German U-boats are sinking the Allied freighters that carry precious cargo across the Atlantic. They intend to strangle Britain into submission. Two years into the war, they are succeeding. Twenty-year-old Frank Curry signed up during the first fever of mobilization. Now the prairie boy from Winnipeg finds himself part of the longest naval battle in history. What a miserable, rotten, hopeless life. I cannot imagine a more miserable existence than this, of being caught on a corvette in the...